morning everyone. So wonderful to be sharing with you all this Sunday morning. Last week, Reverend Holoberwe reached, preached about Jesus being the bread of life. This week he will remind us that Jesus is our lifeblood. Just a quick reminder to get some bread and grape juice ready for communion after the sermon. I just want to thank our wonderful support team who have worked hard to coordinate today's service. Thank you to everyone. May God bless you as you serve him. Here is a hymn. Lord, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we turn? It goes on to say, You are the bread of the world, strength for the weak. You give eternal life, hope for the lost, the way, the truth, the life. You are the light of the world. Keep listening. There's more to come during Hall of Bear's sermon. I pray God's blessing as we worship together. Let me hand over to our worship team this morning.
sisters. The first reading today is taken from Joshua 24 verses 1 to 2a and then we go on to 14 to 18. It says here, the covenant renewed at Shechem. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges and officials of Israel and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the river. Now we move on to the second part, which is 14 to 18. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the good your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods, it was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us and on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we travelled. 
And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites, who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord, because he is our God. This is the end of the first dream. We move to the second one. The second reading is Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. And so it's the armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities, and against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand from them. With a belt of truth, stand firm. Sorry, with a belt of truth, buckled around your waist. With a breastplate of righteousness, fit and in place, and with your feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Play that, pray that I may declare it fearless, fearlessly, as I should. This is the end of the second reading. And this is the gospel reading. This is taken from... Hold on a minute, I've got the wrong one. Just a second. Right. This is John 6, 56 to 69. It's the gospel reading. Okay. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that cannot, that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died. But the, he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many disciples deserve Jesus. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and therefore they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his, of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter, Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the, word, hold, have the word of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the end of the readings. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us become silent before God. To whom shall we go, O Lord? You have the weight of eternal life. At your feet we bow down to receive your weight. We ask that through the Holy Spirit you will open us up that we may receive your word, O Lord, and live accordingly as we hear you speak to us this morning. Our prayers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
One God blessed forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the passages that we have read this morning directs us to a place of total commitment. A place of total commitment to the Lord. A place of confessing only God as our portion and our reward. Moses, the servant of God, has passed away. Now Joshua stands as the leader of Israel. The people are no longer those without a home, but they now have a home. And Joshua gathers all the people of Israel at Shechem, an old shrine in which Jacob bought a piece of land and there built an altar for the Lord and called it El Elohe Israel, meaning God, the God of Israel, or the great God of Israel. And now all people are summoned in that place. All tribes, all elders, the heads and judges and officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. When you look at the act of gathering as these people are coming together, one may argue that this was in itself a liturgical act of gathering in a place of worship where the people of God come together as they are being summoned, as they are being called to come and worship the Lord. And this is what we see, that Joshua summons everybody to come into that meeting place. From verses 2 to 13, of Joshua, we are reminded, or Joshua reminds this group of people or this Israelite community of who God is and of who God has been to them, of how faithful he has been to them on their journey to Canaan. He reminds them of the faithfulness of God to the covenant he made with the patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He reminds them of how God delivered them with a mighty hand from their enemies, of how God took them out of Egypt, that house of bondage, and journeyed with them in the wilderness during their time of strife and struggle, leading them to a home, a home through which they had to pass the seas, they, they, they had to pass the Red Sea, they had to pass the river, they had to pass the river Jordan. And now they stand in the very same home with their own eyes seeing the fulfillment of God's promises. The passage that we have read, Joshua, calls them to make a choice, a choice of whom they will serve, whether they want to serve the gods of the Amorites and the Egyptians or the God of Israel, a God whom they have seen and experienced in their lives. To them he says, it is impossible to serve two masters. You must choose whom to serve this day. Choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell today. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He puts a challenge to them and discloses his choice and the choice that he has made for his family, or the choice that he, together with his family, made, that they will only serve the Lord, the God of Israel. Israel is put in a position where they have to reflect on their lives, they have to reflect on the journey, they have to make choices about who they are as a people and what direction they want to take as they continue with, the, with, with their life. Choose this day whom you will serve. Choose this day whether you will stand with the Lord, the God of Israel whom you have seen, who has mightily displayed his splendor in your presence, who has delivered you with his mighty hand, who has healed your diseases, who has forgiven your sins when you sinned, who has lifted, up, lifted you up out of the pit, when you were sinking in the pit of despair, choose this day whom you will serve, this God or those gods that the Egyptians worshipped. Brothers and sisters, listen very clearly to the response of Israel. It's a positive one. 
They recall the wonderful things that God has done for them. That is what comes to their mind as they are in this place. The wonderful things that God has done for them. And as a response, they pledge their commitment to the Lord. They rekindle their commitment to the Lord. They reaffirm their commitment as the people of God. They affirm that what God has done for them is far much greater for them to forsake the Lord for other gods. Their expression, brothers and sisters, is of a people who owe their very, ex their very existence to this God. The expression is of people who are saying, we are indebted to this God. We live by his permission. We are alive because he has allowed us to walk the length of the living. How can we, how can we today choose these other gods and not this God who has been faithful in carrying us when we were at the lowest in our lives? A God who gave us a name when we had no name. A God who gave us a home when we had no home. How can we do that, Joshua? How can we? One can actually hear them saying that. We will serve the Lord together with you and your family. For he is our God. Brothers and sisters, we have to understand that these people are owning and claiming God as their own. They are saying we will not forsake him. We will not say forsake the God of Israel. Because as the people of Israel, we understand him as our God. He is our God. We have seen him. We have experienced his love. We have experienced his grace. We have experienced his touch in this life. We have seen him journeying with us. How can we not today see and serve this very God? The confession that the people of Israel are making is reiterated by the disciples of Jesus Christ. In a simple question, brothers and sisters, the theme that we journey under this, this, this morning, to whom shall we go, O Lord, for you are our life. To whom shall we go, O Lord, for indeed in you we have received abundance of life. After an encounter with a lesson which was not received well, as we read it last week, last Sunday, a message where Christ is saying, I am the living bread that gives eternal life to all men. If anyone wants to have life, he must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And that one will have heart, will have life in the kingdom of God. He says, my flesh will be given, will be given. That people may have life and have it in abundance. A lesson, brothers and sisters, that his flesh and blood is the food of eternal life. To them, this teaching was beyond their imagination. It was ridiculous that he is to be consumed, as we had their complaining, their dispute of the, of the Jewish people. How can he give us his flesh? How possible is it? Upon hearing the teaching, many of the disciples complained among themselves from the passage that we have read, especially from verse, verse number 60. In, in the Gospel of John, that upon hearing the teaching men of his disciples complained of how difficult a teaching it was. This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? Now Jesus descends the complaints that are happening in the, within the disciples and he goes closer to them. Does this teaching offend you? What more if you see the Son of Man going up as he came down? Jesus Christ makes it, makes it clear to this group of people, to those who were following, that it takes God for one to follow. It is not so much a man-manufactured decision to follow, but it takes God who, brothers and sisters, comes and overwhelms us with this zeal to come after him. It takes God for one to follow God, for, to follow Christ. And it takes God for one to believe in the life which God brings to them, for one to receive the life which is being presented to them. And upon hearing this, we are told in verse number 66, that many of his disciples left. They decided to go back from whence they came. 
They decided to go back to their, to their lives, their ordinary lives, if we can put them. They're no longer following him. They went back. Here, brothers and sisters, lack of belief, of believing is displayed by turning back. Though they saw all that Christ did, though they experienced all that he was, that they saw the new Moses through him, the prophet who was to come into the world. But at the face of a misunderstanding, they decide to go back. They decide to fall away. They, 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 they did not trust brothers and sisters in God's providence. The same people who witnessed the miraculous acts of Christ, who participated in the great feeding, they are the ones who are now saying, we cannot believe this teaching, and we cannot continue following this man. Let us go back once we came. The misunderstanding, they feel, this is just too much. This is just too much. And when Jesus looks at the masses, the, the, the crowds who, who were departing from him, he raises a very important question for us to reflect on this, this morning, brothers and sisters. Do you also want to go away? He turns to his disciples. And now when we look, read the Gospel of John, you have to see that there are two two groups of disciples. The first group of disciples are the 12 disciples, and the other group, bigger group of disciples are those who were experiencing the miracles of Christ, and when they saw him healing someone, they followed. Those who saw him feeding bread to a, to a, to a lot of people, and they all came flocking after him because of the miraculous acts that they have seen. Now Jesus is turning to the 12 because a lot of people are leaving. He says to them, do you also want to go away? Do you also want to leave me? Do you want to go and leave me? What a challenging question, brothers and sisters. But there is something remarkable that we have to see in the response. Something as close as remarkable to what we heard from the Israel during the, of Joshua's time. Here we hear Peter giving a response. The response of Peter gives or shows clearly that he had a clear understanding of where he stood or where they stood with Christ because he was not speaking only for himself. This is the confession of someone who enjoys the benefits of his union with Christ, the confession of one who came to the realization that there is no better life away from Christ. A confession of someone who came to understand that away from Christ there is no life at all. It is like cutting the water supply from the tree. Or uprooting the tree from the soil and expecting it to continue living. This is what Peter comes to the realization. This group of men, this group of disciples who have found life in this Christ. Find life in Christ. Peter paints a picture to say it is so hopeless. It is so hopeless to live away from Christ. It's like a tree that has been uprooted, that is expected to flourish, that is expected to give fruits. One can just imagine the hopelessness and the helplessness of such a tree. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter simply declares that this is our opportunity and we cannot afford to let it slip through our fingers. You are our only option. You are our only hope for the future. These are people who have come to understand that life with Christ is better than life anywhere else. As the psalmist proclaims, in Psalm number 84, verse 10, I will rather be the doorkeeper in the house of my Lord than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. A confession, brothers and sisters, of a person who has come to the realization that Christ is the only source of good life, that the only sure hope for the future is in him alone. And Paul, in view of this, challenges 
the Ephesians as he writes to them. He challenges us as well, as he challenged the Ephesian church, to put on this Christ. When he says put on the whole armor of God, brothers and sisters, Christ is this armor. When we have clothed ourselves with Christ, we will be able to stand firm even in the face of adversity, even when our lives are shaken from all sides because of the principalities of this world, because of the circumstances that aims to derail us from our faith, to take us away from our commitment to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, when we have clothed ourselves with Christ, we will stand no matter what. We will stand. And we will confess like Peter, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you are our life. Maybe the question might be, what does it mean to have Christ as our life? When the disciples, the symbol Judean men, the fishermen, the tax collectors, when they were called by Jesus, that was for them an opportunity, an opportunity that has never been offered to them before. We see their response to the call that there is no hesitation whatsoever. They simply follow as Christ calls. They heard and believed the announcement of Jesus that he is the bread of life, he is the stream of living waters. They realized that this was an opportunity to dwell in the presence of the Most High God, an opportunity to be connected to the source of all good things. Who can let such an opportunity go? There is no any other place better than what we have experienced in you. And Peter is not saying, where shall we go? But to whom shall we go, O Lord? Meaning we can never just be. We can never be free agents. For even those who claim to be free agents, they belong somewhere. Those who claim to be atheists, who say, we don't believe in a God, they believe, or we don't believe, they believe something. Brothers and sisters, when we are not in Christ, we are in someone else. We are united with someone else. Hence the question of Peter, to whom shall we go, Lord? Beloved in the Lord, the believing and coming to know, in verse number 69, con connotes intimacy and closeness of relationship. We need to reach a point of knowing that a minute away from God is the worst experience we can ever imagine. And Peter comes out with that truth. We have to come to know that you, Christ, are the Holy One of God. We have to come to confess that he is the Holy One of God, the one who God sanctified and sent into the world. He is the word that was in the beginning with God, the one who is life, the one who gives life to the world. We have life because of you. We have been transformed by you alone. Our lives are changed because of you, Christ. A confession of people who have been touched and transformed in a special way from their lowly existence from their position as aliens to the covenants of promise, given a purpose in life and a place to belong, as we hear in 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. The doing of the Lord, beloved. We need to keep surrendering our lives in the hands of God, no matter the challenges and the circumstances we find ourselves in. For there is no better place than in Him. Of course, our world tries to offer alternatives through ideologies, through philosophies, philosophies that are concerned with individualism, me, I, and myself, as long as you are happy, it's fine. Human tradition, as Paul in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8, wants, see to it, that nobody takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. But all these brothers and sisters that the world, the alternatives that the world offers, are futile, temporal solutions. Very futile. Temporal, temporal solutions, if ever we can call them solutions. My dear brothers and sisters, there may be painful moments we encounter in this life, and as such we might be tempted to give up we may find ourselves in a place where we are confused. Life gets confusing. 
painful seasons of our lives. Brothers and sisters, we can never go wrong when we are in the hands of our loving God. A God who declares that he is the bread of life and the spring of living water. Let us continue following him, entrusting our lives in him as Israel of old, as Peter and the disciples. To whom shall we go, O Lord? You have the words of eternal life. We follow because we know the one we are following, not so much because we understand the course of the journey, but because we know that we are following the one who is leading us to abundance of life. To whom shall we go, O Lord? You alone are our life. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us become silent in the presence of God. These ordinary elements speak to us of the gospel of Jesus Christ who died and rose again so that we may have life to the full with God. In celebrating the meal of the Lord's Supper, we celebrate the presence of the risen Christ among us, at the center of our lives, at the center of our very being, at the heart of our community, yes, at the heart of creation. Recognize the actions of giving thanks, receiving and giving of the grace of God, the remembering and the participating. The sharing in this meal is for all who love Jesus and who want to love him, to love him more.
those who have much faith and those who have little, those who come often and those who do not come often, those who, say, who have tried to follow and those who have failed. The Lord Jesus loves you all tenderly and graciously. The table is prepared. The meal is ready. Christ is here with us. Come before the, because the Lord invites us all to meet, to meet God here, to share in this sacrament of grace. The Lord is with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Thanks and praise we give to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that even at this time, when we are worshipping from home, you are near to each of us where we are. We thank you that we can worship you, Lord our God. We acknowledge that it is because you, Lord Jesus, gave up your life that we are free to come to you at any place and time. Thank you for this opportunity to share in and to remember your grace towards us. Bless the elements, O Lord, which are set before us, that we may truly experience Christ present as we drink from this cup and eat of the bread. We join with the heavenly host as we proclaim together, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the Lamb who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Trusting not in any goodness of our own, but only in your mercy we draw near to your table, believing with confident hearts in the great mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Amen. For the sake of the offering made once and for all upon the cross, we ask you to grant us and all your people the fullness of your redeeming grace and love. And here we offer and present to you ourselves to be an acceptable sacrifice, holy and living, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray together as the Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The scriptures teaches us that on the night on which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and giving thanks for it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take it, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, saying, and gave thanks to God for it. Then he gave it to his disciples and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, sealed by my blood. Drink of it all, all of you, in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. Following the example, the command, and in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take it, do it in remembrance of me. 
In the same man after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Drink from it as often as you do in remembrance of me. The cup of salvation. Apostle Paul writes to the Romans that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the free, by, by the free gift of God's grace, all are put right with God through Jesus Christ who sets us free. Amen. Let us pray together. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sin, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us your peace. Come now, let us eat together the body of our Lord. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for us. Come, let us drink together. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ poured for us. Amen. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for your love and mercy that endures forever. We thank you, Lord, for your word that comes to us at the right time. You are enough for us, Christ. Indeed, we will serve you because you are our God. To whom shall we go, O Lord? For you alone have the weights of eternal life. May you continue to convict us, O Lord. May you continue to assure us that we belong to you as your children. As you have done by feeding us at your table with your body and blood, confirming us as your children once again, Lord. May it ever be printed in us, in our minds, and on our hearts, that we belong to you in body and soul, in this life, and that to come, our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, grant us, we pray, grace and strength to love others as Christ loved us, that being fed by his mercy, we may all share that mercy with all whom we engage. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. It's our offertory time. This is our time for us to reflect on the wonderful things God has blessed us with as we bring him our offertory this morning. You can do a bank transfer or add your offertory to a jar for storage until you can bring your gifts to church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for all your gifts, and we ask you to bless our offertory to be used for the extension of your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us come to our Father in prayer. Almighty God and Father, we praise and glorify you today. We thank you for your wonderful promises that we put our trust in you, Father, as you pour your Holy Spirit into our lives, refreshing us. Once again, Father, we bring our concerns, our pains, our struggles, our anxieties to you. In the midst of this uncertain time in which we are living, forgive us and cleanse us, Lord. Renew us and strengthen us in your word. Remind us to worry less, 
and pray more. Remind us to trust you in the plan you have for each one of us. Allow your Holy Spirit to fill us, Lord. You know all that lies in our hearts, the unspoken and the hidden. Father, we look to you for guidance as we echo the words of Joshua. To whom shall we go, Lord? You are our life. Cultivate in us, Father, a quiet heart, one that is open to accept what it is you want us to do and with what we have been given. Give us energetic hearts so that others can sense this energy and zest for you by the acts we do or the words we say or the things we do not do or take part in. Grant us grateful hearts, thankful for the many blessings we enjoy. Give us repentful hearts where we seek your forgiveness for our sins. Lord God, we rest in you, our provider and our father. We lean into your love this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness. You call us to love you with our whole being and to love our neighbours as ourselves. Lord, we pray now for others. You came to those who were broken. We pray for the vulnerable and the marginalised, the hungry and desolate, as well as the sick, suffering and grieving. We ask your blessings on our St Paul's family. We pray especially for Peggy Key, Heather Chapman, Ernest van Skalkbeek, Val Silifant, Kevin Demmer, Renee LaRue, Burton Thea Arm, Tommy Williams and Abe Ledwaba. Holy Spirit, surround them with your love and let them feel your presence today. We ask you to accept our prayers in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we may come set your hearts ablaze with hope. Like wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power.
time. Happy birthday to everyone celebrating birthdays this week. May you be richly blessed on your special day. The names are on the screen and I encourage you to give them a call and wish them on their birthday. Notices. There's a council meeting tomorrow evening at 7pm. We look forward to seeing all the councillors there. Best wishes to you all for a wonderful week. Please join me as we say the benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.